Revelation, top of page 917. But we're going to go back to line 19 so that we can do the stanza uh, in full. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Okay, And we talked about how the speaker shifts um, kind of address, shifts how the, uh, the speaker addresses the hearers or listeners. Call us what you will, so it's now the two together, we are made such by love. That is, whatever you call us, really, however you perceive us, we are that because of love. So, the speaker gives us an image. And I talked to you the other day about how Don is famous for what are called his metaphysical conceits, okay? Which is the linking together of two widely or wildly, depending on how you want to put it, dissimilar things by finding one thing that kind of connects them. Call her one, me another fly. Fly there, just meaning moth, okay? We're tapers too, and at our own cost die. So, she's a moth, I'm a moth. She's a taper, a candle, I'm a taper. Moth flies to candle, and, you know, it's why bug zappers work out on the front porch. You have a light, the bug comes to it, and gets zapped. Same kind of thing. I'm attracted to her, she's attracted to me, we're told, and at our own cost, die. And you've got a long footnote there, you know, which we've talked about before. To die refers to reaching orgasm, and it was a belief in Dunn's day that every time you reach orgasm, you lose a day of life. You're, you're going to die, okay? One day earlier than you normally would have. So that's one image. Because we're attracted and drawn to each other, by our cost, by that expense, you know, how did Shakespeare put the expense of spirit in a waste <clears throat> in a waste of shame is lust in action. The reason ex spirit is expended, that's the dying part, okay? So that's one image. Now we get another image. So, moths drawn to candles. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. You've got another footnote. The eagle being the image of masculine sexuality, okay, or strength. And the dove being the symbol of feminine sexuality or strength. And notice, we in us. The speaker is saying each of us has these two elements. Okay. Third image. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. We two, being one, <coughs> are it. You got a gloss about the mythological or mythical phoenix. Interestingly, your gloss does not mention the phoenix lives for 500 years. And then poof. Bursts into flame. All right? And then what? Rises from its death. There's the image Dunn wants to leave us with. He says, we are like the phoenix. Okay? How so? We two, being one, are it. We die through sex. And then what? Rise again. And then die, rise again, etc. So that's what, the third image? So to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. Think of that. What did Shakespeare say in Sonnet 20? Nature made you for a woman. That is, originally, to be a woman. But then, because nature fell a-doting, by adding one thing to thee of my thing, of my purpose... Nothing. Okay? So originally you were made to be a woman, but she added one thing. Now you fit what I want, not at all. So, Dunn is saying, you know, it's, it's this kind of thing. Male, female. Or, if you want, female, male. It doesn't matter. I don't mean one top, one bottom kind of thing. 
They do it. They what? They fit. And when they fit together, you no longer have male or female. You no longer have halves. You have a whole. Okay? Kind of like in that, you know, cheesy uh, Tom Cruise movie, Jerry Maguire, or what's her name, says at the end, you complete me. It's the idea of being incomplete. And we still, I mean, we got this all throughout popular culture. The idea of the soulmate. Your soul fits my soul kind of a thing. Okay? <coughs> so, so, to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. We die and rise the same. We die to one neutral thing fit, and we rise and prove mysterious by this Louvre. Okay, but that last dying and rising, yeah, the sexual aspect is there, but I think there's more than that. He's talking about not just sexual love. He's talking about the speaker, not Again, don't confuse the speaker with with Dunn. Okay, Dunn's the writer. The speaker is the person telling us the poem. I think the speaker is also suggesting there's some there's a spiritual component here, in that death leads to resurrection. We rise, we die and rise the same, improve mysterious. By this Louvre. What's a mystery? Define the word. Or give an example. Of a mystery. You guys are all too young to remember. There was a, a um, hijacker. Back in the early 1970s. 73. Named D.B. Cooper. All we have. Is an image. Okay. Sweatshirt. Big black glasses, kind of hair, okay? Took a flight on a plane in the Pacific Northwest. Bunch of money, okay? Jumped out of the plane over the border between Oregon and Washington. Never found, never discovered. Some of the money was discovered about 20, 30 years ago. Kids were doing something along the Columbia Gorge and they found some of the money. His body's never been recovered. Is that a mystery? What happens if they find the body? Mystery solved, right? Yes and no. This part of the word mysterious implies cannot be known. Okay? Agatha Christie did not write, even though it says on the back covers of her books, mystery, did not write mysteries. She wrote what? Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Purloined Letter is considered to be the first piece of detective fiction. Detective. You have somebody detecting. It's a whodunit. Okay? Scooby-Doo's all whodunits. Why? Because they find out who did it. If they find the body, they'll know who D.B. Cooper was, okay? Because it was a um, fake name, okay? A real mystery is something that cannot be intellectually resolved, something that cannot be cannot be intellectually understood or reasoned out. It's really used primarily for religious or mythological things. Okay? In the Christian tradition, the incarnation of Jesus, how fully God up there created you know, everything can become an 8-pound, 2-ounce, 21-inch long baby. The idea of the Trinity, three persons, one essence, one beat, you know, the resurrection, dying and rising. How did it happen? See, the medieval Catholic Church tried to reason all of this out, which is why they came up with, not for the resurrection, but for communion, they came up with the idea of, see if I can spell it, transubstantiation. 
transubstanti transubstantiation. Okay, the root of that is substance. We all know what trans means. Okay, and then the eation noun form, changing the substance. Okay, because the medievals believed in the difference between what's called, I think we've talked about this, substance and accidents. What is the substance of this? What is its essence? What is this? Paper, okay? What's paper made of? Trees, wood pulp, okay? So it's substance, it's essence. The stuff that it is made of is cellulose. It's tree wood pulp. Its accidents is how it appears. What's its appearance? Paper. Okay? The accidents of this is what? You can even read it if you want to get specific. It's a Dasani water bottle. It's a bottle. That's its accidents. Okay? What's its substance? What's the essence of plastic? Louder? What kind of chemicals? This is why we'll never get to a quote-unquote totally green world. Notwithstanding what you might wish for. It's petroleum. Oil. Fossil fuels. In fact, an awful lot of what you look around and see in this room, except for the concrete block walls, all comes from fossil fuels. The plastic flooring, the plastic desk, the whiteboard, the markers, the ink in the markers, 90% of what is in your computers comes from petroleum. Much of your clothing, unless you're wearing 100% cotton, or 100% wool, or 100% linen, comes from, if it has polyester, if it has, it's from dead dinosaurs and, you know, stuff like that, okay? So, transubstance, meaning you change the essence. Transubstantiation, again, medieval Catholic Church, you've got, assume this is bread, you've got bread, and you've got wine, okay? And the priest holds them up and says, I have had this on the board. Hawk est corpus. This is my body. It's part of the rite of communion. This is my body shed for you. This is my this is my body broken for you. This is my blood, the wine, shed for you. And when the priest in a Catholic church does that and raises those elements, the Catholic church said, at that point, the Holy Spirit descends and changes that wine into blood. Literal blood. It tastes like wine still. Why? Because its accidents doesn't change. Its appearance doesn't change. You don't go up to the chalice and look in and suddenly see, you know, V8. It doesn't look like blood. It still looks, tastes, smells like wine. But its substance has mysteriously been changed. Okay? That's part of what that idea, mystery, how do you understand it? The medieval Catholic Church tried to, because of the influence of scholastic philosophers, they tried to reason everything out. Okay? This is one of the reasons Luther, for example, eventually did away with communion. It's like, it's too, it's become too rational. In the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, what are called, this is called, for example, I don't have it written down here, the communion is called a sacrament in the Catholic Church. Okay? In the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, it's a, called a mystery. You have the mystery of communion. You have the mystery of baptism. Why? How do you explain dunking somebody in water Makes them dead, pulling them back out, now makes them alive again. But a different person then that went in the water. You know. So, we are made mysterious 
by this love. We are made a mystery. We cannot. You can't look at us and just start taking everything apart. We can die by it, if not live by love. Religious spiritual love or profane sexual love? Yes. Both. This is one of the things Dunn is most famous for. How he completely blends or merges the sacred and the profane. The divine and the physical. Or the spiritual and the physical. Okay? And if unfit for tombs and hearse our legend be, unfit, notice, for tombs, like on a tombstone, okay, our legend, the story about us be, notice, what is being kind of suggested there? Legends are, it's kind of implied, are based on what? Facts. Because the two people, the speaker is suggesting, we really were, we really lived. But now, they're considered what? To be legendary. So, if unfit for tombs and hearse our legend be, it will be fit for verse, for poetry. It will be fit, it will be meeting, it will be appropriate for poetry. And if no piece of chronicle reprove, think of Shakespeare's sonnets, when in the chronicle of wasted time, okay, so if we're not proven to be appropriate for a chronicle, what's a chronicle really? What is a chronicle supposed to be? Like the books of chronicles in the Old Testament. Supposedly, they're history. Okay? You have the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. It's a listing of dates and events. Historical fact, so to speak. So he says, if we're not right for chronicles, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms. Sonnets, little love songs. And your gloss tells you room is the English trans is another meaning of stanza in Italian. So we'll build in sonnets little or pretty stanzas. Sonnets are made out of quatrains or um, octave and sestet. As well, a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes. A well-wrought urn. A beautiful, you know, funerary urn. As well, one of those well-made is fitting for ashes of somebody. Okay? As half-acre tombs. And there are tombs that are half an acre large. A tomb was discovered oh, five, ten years ago in a part of Greece that was originally, excuse me, that was initially thought to be Alexander the Great's tomb because we don't know where it is. See, Alexander the Great died on one of his journeys in the east. He died in India, I believe it was. Okay, It's now thought that that tomb, which was over a single tomb, over an acre in size, Okay, might have belonged to King Philip, Alexander's father. So, as well a well wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes, the greatest ashes as half acre tombs, and by these hymns, what hymns? The love songs, the sonnets. All shall approve us. Approve. They will. Give their assent to us, and there's the title, canonized for love. We will be made what? For love. What does canonization do? Makes you, makes you a saint. We will be approved. See, it's not just, yeah, I think they're a saint. Approved means you've gone through the process. You know, it starts with calling somebody, naming somebody, blessed. If you're blessed, you're not a saint yet. 
you got to go through the whole rigmarole, the whole practice. Okay, And we shall be approved, canonized, for we'll be saints of love. And thus invoke us. Why do you make somebody a saint? Why was, you know, I think it was the 1990s. Why was Pope John Paul II made a saint? Well, partly because people said he had appeared to him after his death. He had appeared to them after his death. He'd done miracles after his death. It has to be more than one. Okay, it has to be proof, essentially. There's a whole process in the Vatican for doing this. And so that that saint can then be invoked. You can pray to that saint. There are saints for just about, I've, I've got a thing at home, it lists, you know, saints and what they can be prayed for, or to for. There are saints of lost causes, there are saints for blindness, there are saints for bowel disorders, for broken arms, broken hands, broken everything. Saints for diseases of the mind, whole nine yards. You, you out there, now reading this, now listening, you whom reverend love, no, no, no. It's not you out there, you reading or listening. This is the invocation. This is the prayer that we be made to us. Okay? The two individuals that are kind of referred to throughout this poem. You whom reverend love made one another's hermitage. What's a hermitage? It's the place where a hermit lives like a monastery or a convent. Reverend love. Not sexual love. It's not romantic love. It's not uh, erotic love. Reverend. It's holy. It's devout. It's spiritual. You made what? Reverend love made you one another's hermitage. In other words, made for him, her, the place of refuge. Made him for her, the place of refuge, the place of solitude, the place of stillness, the place of devotion. You, the two of you, to whom love was peace that now is rage. What's what's the speaker mean? Love that, skip the peace part, that now is rage. You don't have to ask this question. It's kind of rhetorical. How many of you have been in love? Probably most people in here. What was that experience of love? Was it, you know, you're down here, you fall in love, but notice the term we say fall. That implies a descent. No. Falling in love is actually what? It's a rising. And then what? It just keeps rising. I've been married 37 years. It's not just, you know, Continual rising, almost 37 years. It's not just continual rising. Because at some point, what happens? We saw this in Shakespeare's sonnets between the speaker and the people being addressed. You rise, and then you fall a little, and then you rise again, and you fall a little, and maybe you rise more, and then you fall more. And it... What is that? Up and down of life. The vagaries of human existence. That's the rage. Okay? Rage doesn't just necessarily mean always anger, frustration, you know, kind of a thing. But the speaker says in this prayer to the two now, you to whom love was peace. What's peace? What are you when you are, quote, this is assuming you've been at peace. What are you when you are at peace? calm, content. (sighs) There's no what if you are content. That's why St. Paul says, be content in all things. There's no desire. There's no wish. There's no want. There's no anger. There's no frustration. 
you know, some people would say, yeah, it's because if they had an EKG done on you, you're flatlined. <laughs> you're dead. That's, you know, Sophocles says at the end of Oedipus the King, count no man blessed. Anybody know how it ends? Until he's dead. Another translation. Count no man happy until he's dead. Why? Because you, then you're done with Hamlet slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So, you to whom love was peace, that now, now, down here in our world, in the present, is rage, who did the whole world's soul contract. And your gloss says, you know, manuscript versions have extract. I've seen this poem in a bunch of manuscript versions, and I can't think of one that had extract. So I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. Anyways, I'm, it probably is there. Who did the whole world's soul contract. What does that mean? It contracted. What do you do when you have something that contracts? It gets smaller. It gets more compact. So you contracted the whole world's soul. That is, into you too. Now to notice, not souls. Why? Because they too, being one, and drove into the glasses of your eyes, right? Because his eyes, when she looks in his eyes, are glasses, mirrors. What does she see? She sees herself. And what does he see when he looks in his or her eyes? He sees himself. Into the glasses of your eyes, so made such, so made, that is, In doing so, you made such, the eyes, mirrors, and such spies that they did all to you epitomize. When you looked into her eyes and she looked into your eyes, her eyes became what? The epitome of all women's eyes. His eyes became the epitome of all men's eyes. And we're back to that image of if there was ever love I had and got from the good morrow, it was but a dream of you. Countries, towns, courts. That is, and drove into the glasses of your eyes, countries, towns, courts. Leave the parenthetical out for a moment. So when he looks into her, he sees what? Countries, Towns, court, all levels of kind of human political existence. Everything. The whole world's soul. And thus invoke us. And this is actually what is finally now being invoked. We beg from above a pattern of your love. This is what you're going to look for. You're going to pray to us and say, show us the way. Show us the pattern. That is, how do we follow you? What are the breadcrumbs? What do we need to do to attain this kind of love? Okay? That is a love poem. I mean, that is not overtly talking about sex or anything, and it's not overtly or overly spiritual, but it combines the two. Now go from there to, boy, I usually do a lot more of these poems, but we just don't have time. The Flea on page 920. Okay? This is perhaps one of the best known of Dunn's poems. Okay? For the simple reason... Of the metaphysical conceit. Okay, keep in mind. Two wildly or widely dissimilar things, as Dryden puts it, violently yoked together. Like, this thing does not want to get close to this thing. And Dunn links them. The flea. Mark but this flea, and mark in this, how little that which thou denyest me is. 
it sucked me first and now sucks thee. Remember the long S and the F? He's punning there. It sucked me first and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin nor shame nor loss of maidenhead. Yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. So let's look at that first stanza. This, by the way, is the poem that I found a copy of that was missing two of the lines that nobody had cataloged before as being uh, Dunn's poem in this one manuscript. So mark means take note of. Look at this flea. We probably wouldn't think of the image here of a flea as being appropriate because of what's going to be described in the poem, a tick would be a better idea, all right? Because of what ticks do. So, look at this flea and look in this. That is, take note of what I'm going to say. Because I'm going to use this flea as something to extrapolate on. Mark in this, how little that which thou denied me is. Okay? So the flea is tiny, right? I don't know if you've ever had pets with fleas. You know, cats usually have more fleas than dogs. But, you know, fleas are often very, very small, sometimes hard to see. They can get bigger because of what they do. So he compares the size of the flea with the size, metaphorically speaking, of what she's denying him. It sucked me first and now sucks thee. Your gloss. Me, it sucked first in many manuscripts. I don't see any reason why to include that gloss, because it doesn't change the meaning at all. It sucked me first, and now sucks thee, and in this flea are two bloods mingled be. Speaker's subsequent argument hinges on the traditional belief that blood mixed during sexual intercourse. Okay, two bloods mingled be. You could replace reading for the purpose of the poem. You could replace bloods with Bodily fluids, okay? Our bodily fluids are mingled in this flea. Thou knowest that this cannot be shame. Uh, this cannot be said. What? Thou knowest that. Again, I have never seen that reading. Confess it. In this poem, and I've seen this poem again in probably two or three dozen manuscripts. And I can't think of a one that has confessed it. Huh. So, thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead. What's the this? The mingling of our bloods in this flea isn't a shame, excuse me, isn't a sin, nor is it shame, shameful, nor is it loss of maidenhead. You haven't lost your virginity. So, that tells us that the speaker addressing the beloved, assuming maidenhead is referring to a woman, she's still a virgin. Yet this enjoys before it woo. What's the this? So you got to look at it. Every time you see this, you've got to plug in the correct pronoun, oh, excuse me, the correct noun for that demonstrative. This, the flea, the flea enjoys before it woo. The flea, for example, didn't have to do what? To her, for her, with her. Take her out to dinner, buy her roses, car, you know. In pampered, it swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. What's the this in that last line? The swelling with blood. What is the speaker telling the woman? What are they not going to do? Or what is he not going to do to her? You're not going to get pregnant. That's what he's saying. 
he does want to enjoy. He's talking about the whole purpose of the poem, kind of at least, on a very surface level, a very poor surface level, is wooing, courting, seducing, if you want. Okay? So what's the metaphysical conceit? The flea equals or is linked to Sexual intercourse gives a whole new meaning to, you know, flea-ridden dump or flea-ridden hotel kind of a one-night stand kind of a thing. Notice between stanza one and stanza two, she does something. Okay? Oh, stay three lives in one flea spare. What has she done? He says, first line, first stanza, look at this flea and look in this. Stanza two, stay, three lives in one flea spare. She kicks that flea off. What is she getting ready to do? If you've ever had a flea on you, what do you do? You take it and you pinch it between a thumbnail and the finger. And it kills it, so it can't bite you anymore. Three lives in one. How are there three lives in one flea? His life, blood. Her life, her blood. The flea's life. Or, or his life, her life, in the life made by their bloods mixing in this flea. Okay? Where we almost, nay, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed, and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge and you were met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Those are the two lines that were not in the copy that I found. Though parents grudge and you, okay, final three lines. Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be, and sacrilege three sins in killing three. Okay, how can you be more than married? You can be married and not do what? What does the knight in the wife of Bath's tale not want to do after he's forced to wed the loathly lady? He doesn't want to have sex with her. He doesn't want to consummate the marriage. Okay? Not consummating the marriage in the eyes of the Catholic Church meant never married. That's why you can get an annulment. It can be for married for 50 years. And if you can say and prove, we never had sex. It's as if you're never married. Okay, That's why Henry VIII was able to marry his elder brother's wife. He said they never consummated the marriage. Why? Because Catherine never got pregnant. Never got pregnant, they must have never had sex. Okay? So, where we almost, nay, we're more than married. Where? In this flea. So it's not just sexual intercourse. It's also marriage. Or as they say in Princess Bride, marriage. This flea is you and I. In this, the flea, our marriage bed and marriage temple. Notice, I could just keep writing all the things that the speaker is linking the flea to. Metaphysical conceiting, you know, if you want. Though parents grudge and you, it's one of those lines that make people go, hmm, I wonder if Dunn's writing this (laughs) when he and his wife are secretly married. In you, we're met and cloistered. What are cloisters? The cloisters are where monks or nuns live. To be cloistered means to be shut away. Like, you know, high pro, um, juries in high-profile cases. 
get cloistered in hotels. They're not allowed to leave. Cloistered in these living walls of jet. Why living? Because the flea's still alive. Jet is color of darkness, blackness. Though use make you apt to kill me. Use doesn't only mean habit. It also means use. <laughs> though you, though your use of me make you apt to kill me. Sex. Let not to that self-murder added be. Because what's self-murder? Suicide, right? What is suicide? According to the Catholic Church, it's the unforgi unforgivable sin. It's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you're saying, God, my troubles are too big for even you to do anything about. Okay? And you can't repent <laughs> before you commit suicide. Let not to that self-murder added be and sacrilege. How sacrilege? Three sins in killing three. Three sins in killing three what? Three lives. My life, your life, the flea's life. My life, your life, the new life in the flea. But why is that? That's not sacrilege. Killing the idea of threeness. Trinity. That's sacrilege. Something happens between stanza two and stanza three. Cruel and sudden hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? She popped it. He told her, stop. And she goes, oh yeah, smart guy, and pops it. So now there is blood on her finger and on her nail. Nail of innocence? That's an illusion. Who innocently was nailed? Christ. Okay. It could also be an allusion to the, what's called the slaughter of the innocents. The children in Bethlehem, up to the age of two, who were slaughtered by Herod. Wherein could this flea guilty be? Right? Because you should only kill somebody who's guilty. Capital punishment, you know, idea. Wherein could this flea guilty be except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Okay, so maybe it was guilty of that. Yet thou triumphs. What does he mean, thou triumphs? What look does she have on her face? I think it's a grin. And sayst thou thus, that thou findst not thyself nor me the weaker now. He said, stay three lives in one flea spare. She kills the flea and she goes, I don't feel any weaker. I don't feel like my life has gone away from me. Tis true. You're right. Turns the tables. He admits what you're saying uh, via apostrophe. You know, apostrophe is when a person is speaking to somebody else who's not, who doesn't get a reply. Okay. He's saying this and says, "'Tis true, then learn how false fears be." Like what kind of fears? This, alas, is more than we would do. Last line, first stanza. Just so much honor when thou yieldst to me will waste as this flea's death took life from thee. What's meant by honor? Or where, where does her honor reside? In her virginity. And he says, if you sleep with me, you know how much honor you will actually lose? The same amount of life as you lost from this flea. None. None. Why? Nobody will know. Okay. This poem is not meant to be read, taken seriously. I mean, some people have read this before as a serious, you know, kind of seduction poem. 
So if some guy saddles up next to you in a bar, you're having drinks, and, you know, he tries this out. What's going to happen, more than likely? Drink thrown in his face, if he's lucky. Slapped, if he's lucky. Beat the snot out of him, you know, more than likely. It's not meant to be that. It's written for what purpose? To show, I like to put it this way, mental gymnastics. Dunn is demonstrating how witty he can be. I mean, you got to admit, equating a flea with marriage, the marriage temple, sexual inter the whole nine yards, okay, drawing the similarity between those things. I mean, most people would say, ew, gross. But apparently Dunn's friends liked it. Because this poem was copied a lot. I mean, it probably went, damn, John, that's really witty. That's really smart. Okay? I imagine if he showed it to women friends, they were like, please, dude, you, no, not going to happen. Okay? Go from there. Do we have time? Probably not. To a valediction forbidding morning. What's a valediction? What does a valedictorian do? And by the way, I'll just throw out my own two cents here. You should only have one valedictorian. I remember when my kids graduated high school. Every stinking one of them. They had like between 13 and 20 valedictorians. Because principals didn't want to do a principal's job and decide. There's one. The best one. Okay. A valedictorian delivers the valedictory address. Vale, goodbye, <laughs> dictory, diction, word. It's a word saying goodbye, like we're all out of here now. Okay? This is a valediction forbidding morning. Dunn wrote three valedictions. Valediction forbidding morning, a valediction of weeping, and I can't remember the third one. Okay? As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say no, so let, uh, I'm going to do two stanzas at a time, so let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempest move, to our profanation of our joys, to tell the laity our love. And we're back to the ideas that we saw in the canonization. Okay, so, as virtuous men pass mildly away, why? Dunn's playing upon an old commonplace notion that virtuous people die quietly. What's one of the greatest English poems in the English language that describes not dying quietly? Anybody know? Yeah, that one. Dylan Thomas, do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light, you know. Beautiful, um, not Tercet, Villanelle, okay, is the poetic structure there, okay. So, virtuous men, you don't know when they go. Notice, while some of their friends, sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say, nope, not dead yet. He's still breathing. So let us melt and make no noise. That is, let us separate. Because what do virtuous men do when they die? Their souls depart. The body's left. It's probably also referring to the quiet death, the so-called death rattle. That when somebody is about to die, they kind of go, and that's the soul leaving the body, you know. My daughter's an ICU nurse. She swears, yeah, there is a death rattle. It often happens, you know, or just before. Okay. So, so let us melt and make no noise. I'll talk about why they're melting in a moment. 
No tear floods nor sigh tempest move. That is, no loud crying, no loud sighing, no tears. Why? Because that would be a profanation of our joys. It would make (coughs) profane our joys. The speaker is saying our joys are therefore what? If they're not profane, they're the opposite. They're spiritual. They're heavenly. They're holy. They're sanctified. And it would dirty them. It would bring them down to the level of the earth. To do what? Tell the laity of our Louvre. How would they tell the laity of our Louvre? By making a big stink about separating. Okay. Back up for just a moment. Dunn's first biographer, a guy named Isaac Walton, who's most famous for writing a book on angling, fishing, oddly enough. Isaac Walton said that Dunn composed this poem when he was getting ready in 1610, 1611, something like that, getting ready to leave his wife temporarily, not leave, leave, but to go to a trip on the continent to go to Europe with his employer, Sir Robert Drury. And she didn't want him to leave. Why? She had a premonition. She was pregnant at the time. She was pregnant most of the time. She had a premonition something was going to happen to the baby. Well, when Dunn did get back from that trip, his wife had a stillborn child. Or while he was gone, she had a stillborn child. So she didn't want him to go. Okay, That's why he's saying, if we read that into this, that's why the speaker is saying, don't make a big fuss about my leaving. Let's just kind of keep it quiet. Okay? Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though great or far, is innocent. Moving of the earth. What's that referring to? Earthquakes. How many of you have been in an earthquake? Born and raised in California, the biggest one was like a 6.3. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, you're sitting there, can remember several times, sitting there in the living room and all of a sudden feeling sick to my stomach. I go in my dad's den because he had swords hanging from the ceiling and they're swaying. Go look out back at our above ground pool and water sloshing over the sides of the pool. So big enough quake to get six inch waves, you know, kind of a thing. Every now and then, big enough to see, you know, things shake and stuff. Okay? That, he says, does what? Brings harms and fears. Why? People always ask, when there's a major earthquake, what does it mean? Well, they ask two questions. One, what does it mean? That is, it's symbolic of something. And two, where's God? Where's God when there are bad earthquakes, you know? Men reckon what it did and meant. See, they didn't know about tectonic plates at all. They didn't understand the mechanics of earthquakes. Okay? But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. And you've got a gloss. The precession of the equinox thought to be caused by movements in the celestial spheres. Yes and no. Trepidation means fear of. It also means movement. The movement of the spheres, remember we talked about the other day, here's Earth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, out here is the Empyrean where God dwells. The trepidation, the movement of the spheres, each of these spheres moves, okay? This sphere affects this one, this one affects this one, so you have all of these affecting Earth. This is why astrology is important. Why which planet, which sign you're born under is important. He says, trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, the movement of these is much greater than a little burp under the crust of the earth. He says, is innocent. Innocent how? This is done reporting to us. This is post-1610. Okay? This is done reporting to us his scientific understanding. 
1610, Galileo publishes his findings.